Hello, and welcome to the Dr. Joseph Warren Historical Society interview series with prominent authors and historians specializing in the colonial period and revolutionary America. My name is Randy Flood, and today I am joined by my colleague, Christian Despigna, author of Founding Modern, The Life and Death of Dr. Joseph Warren, The American Revolution's Lost Hero. This presentation is also brought to you in cooperation with The Real American Revolution public television television series and the American Revolution Consortium for Civic Education. So Christian, let's introduce our guest today. Thank you, Randy. Nina Zanieri is executive director of the Paul Revere Memorial Association, a graduate of Boston College with a Bachelor of Arts degree in history and a master's degree in anthropology and museum studies from Brown University. Nina was previously curator of the Rhode Island Historical Society. A former president of the New England Museum Association, she was a recipient of the association's Lifetime Achievement Award in 2015. And Nina, we don't wanna embarrass you anymore because I think we could add another three or four paragraphs to your list of accomplishments, but we're gonna cut it short there and we wanted to welcome you to the program. Well, it's, it's great fun to be with you. And I know, Kristen, you did a, a great talk at our place, an informal talk. Uh, I guess it was two years ago now. And um, we also have a lot of folks who are, are great fans of uh, Dr. Joseph Warren. So the, uh, the connection between Warren and Revere is always one that uh, uh, makes, makes me smile. Right, <laughs> me as well. And so I'm gonna ask you just something silly, something basic for anyone who doesn't know, but what's the difference between the Paul Revere House and the Paul Revere Memorial Association? Are they the same thing or are they different? Um, they are essentially the same thing. Paul Revere Memorial Association is the entity that, in fact, was created once the house was purchased and took the house through the restoration. It's our corporate title. Uh, we run the Paul Revere House, but we also have a couple other buildings. So uh, we are more than the Paul Revere House, although that is the jewel in the crown. So the association is just a slightly larger umbrella that encompasses everything we do. Okay, mm -hmm. and, and, and I don't know if I have this right, but I, usually when we think of Paul Revere, we, we don't quite think of the Revere House being the oldest building in Boston dating back to 1680. Do I have that right? That is correct. Yep. Okay. So do you think, I guess, um, this brick and mortar aspect has, has helped to extend Revere's legacy in, in terms of some kind of historical tangibility? I do. And for a number of reasons. First of all, you have an association that is dedicated to not only preserving this house and also the other buildings we own, but also Revere's legacy. And so we're really charged with that. So if we're not doing that, and then we have this house, and I will say that the house itself is its own attraction without Revere. It's an attraction because of Revere, but it's also the only house that's open as a house museum along the Freedom Trail. So there are a number of people who come because it's an old house, even some visitors who don't even know who Paul Revere is. And that, that always surprises us a little, but it does happen. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, we understand that the Paul Revere Association has undertaken a huge renovation program. C can you tell us about it and what's been accomplished and what you hope to accomplish? Well, certainly for a number of years, we spent time focusing on making sure the Revere House was in good shape and that would now only need routine maintenance, no, no major things. But in, we had always been looking for some additional space. Our attendance is quite high. We didn't have some of the basic visitor amenities like public restrooms. We didn't have enough classroom space. Um, we are now north of 300,000 visitors a year. So we really needed some, some, some elbow room. So in 2007, we bought a building right behind us that actually uh, sits on property that Revere had owned. And so it was kind of us buying back Revere's property. It cost us a lot more than Revere would have had to pay for it. But, um, and then we spent the next almost 10 years getting that building uh, stabilized, and restored and also redoing our entire courtyard so that we would be handicapped accessible. And we figured out a way to make the second floor of the Revere House accessible by an elevated walkway that connects the two buildings. And it doesn't even connect into the house. It just sits against the house. So it's, it's really a quite elegant solution. 
And we're really proud that visitors can see uh, both floors of the house. The house that we restored is in 1835 and we saved everything we could, interior stairways, fireplaces, while adding in public restrooms, water fountains, a larger gift shop, and some program space. And you actually spoke in one of the program spaces. Right. So that project, which was about a $4 million project, really allowed us to get up to current modern museum standards for facilities. Right. And it's really been a, a gift and sort of an, an odd thing that happened was now with with COVID and staff in, we're trying to keep people separated. The fact that we have an additional building that we can spread out into has also turned out to be really uh, a blessing in disguise. Yeah, so his, and here's one follow-up question and just for our audience and, and people interested in Paul Revere, when they're walking through the streets of the North End, they come upon Paul Revere's house and they're looking at the facade. Is this what the house would have looked like in the 1770s, 1780s? Paul would probably walk by unless he was at the lower level and he didn't look up. Um, the house went through a number of changes over time. And at the time that it was that they were, the association was thinking about restoring it. Um, it was an immigrant tenement with apartments and shops down below it. It really had a lot of heavy use. But that immigrant building is the one Revere would have recognized. Okay. The association through Joseph Chandler chose to go back to the house's original look. It's 1680 look, which means the roof line at the front, instead of being like this with windows, is pitched down. Right. So people think the house has been, the third floor has been cut off. That's not true. It's the same height. It's just a matter of the roof line, which hides the fact that there's quite large attic there. So, you know, would we restore it differently if we found it now? I don't know, perhaps we would. Um, Chandler really understood that a 17th century house was pretty rare. Um, and so he made, he made that decision. I also think that the family, although I don't have any record of this, it's just speculation, that the family was probably comforted a little bit at the time to find the house needed to be changed to be old. That if they were looking at an immigrant tenement and someone said, well, that's kind of what Revere would have saw, seen, that might have thrown them. That might not right. have, you know, fit how they, and, and that's not a criticism. It's a matter of you're talking about 1902 to 1907. You're talking about a time when people felt that immigrant groups needed to be brought along, needed to be Americanized, needed to, you know, it was, it was a, a product of its time. The, the important thing is the house got saved. Right. Super. Well, Nina, with, uh, with regard to public perception and the renovations that you've done to improve the house and everything, have you noticed any changes in the perception of his legacy? or uh, perception, public perceptions of Revere um, since, you're, since you joined the uh, association? Well, I'd like to say that, I would like to be able to say that we're doing such a great job that all the misconceptions about Revere have magically <laughs> disappeared. But the Longfellow mythology is a lot stronger than we are. Um, I will say that I think visitors, um, are less familiar with the poem. We're seeing that start to happen. Not that they don't know the poem or that children don't still recite it, but it's not as ingrained in the sort of, um, I don't know, canon of American things the way it used to be. That has not affected our attendance, which is, which is great. I mean, I've always thought that might be an issue. I do think that people are still attracted to Revere I think he is kind of an everyman. And I, I do think that we have, you know, we still get visitors who want us to talk about his flaws and visitors who want to talk about him heroically. And I won't, I don't want to go to politics because I'm not sure it's driven by politics. I, th I think it's driven by how people want their American history to be. Some people want to look at the, um, 
the uplifting parts, the parts that make them feel better. Some people want to look at the flaws so that we can be better. Um, and so I'm, I'm not sure it's that anyone is, is good or bad or indifferent. I just think they come at it differently. So I remember I was in the house one time and someone leaned in close and said, in a whispered voice, tell me something they wouldn't want me to know about Paul Revere. <laughs> and, and I wanted to say, well, I'm the they, so go for it. Um, but they almost wanted something. It's like um, entertainment tonight. They wanted a little bit of gossip, a little bit of something. Mm -hmm. And that's more about how humans approach things than anything that has to do with history or knowledge of history. Um, some people want to talk about Penobscot. They want to talk about Revere's um, failings. They, they want him not to be perfect. They want us to know that there were other riders out that night. And we're like, well, we, yes, yes, there were. <laughs> you know, these colonists were not dumb. They, they, they were trying to get it right. So, you know, I, I think things do change as the politics around us changes or the education systems around us change, but it's not dramatic. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you. You mentioned these changes. So let me ask you, what do you think some of the connective points for Revere that have remained constants? I think, and, and this is something that we are focusing on more because of the new building. We have some exhibits that talk about Revere a little more in terms of him, him as an artisan, as a craftsman, as a businessman. Um, I think people find that fascinating and they find a connection there. He was inventive. He was a, you know, he, he went to writing school. He didn't have a deep education, but he pursued, he was fascinated by metals. He pursued different, different things. I think that's appealing to people. It's appealing to people. I think that you can make something of yourself that is above your grade or above your status. He's very much a middle-class person. I think some people are surprised that a rich person doesn't live in a man, that, that a well-known person, a famous person isn't living in a mansion. Mm -hmm. It's a very simple house. And even the house he moved to on Charter Street was not grand. So I think that that sort of middle-class nature makes him appealing. And I think the fact that he has flaws and that we're willing to talk about those openly um, make people think, you know, not everybody gets everything right all the time. Yeah, right. You're not trying to sanitize his character in any way. No. I think you've done a really balanced job of, of presenting the, the, the full picture of Revere. The next thing I wanted to ask you was, you know, how has, I know you talked about visitation a little bit, but how has it changed both in numbers and in makeup? And do and you think Revere's popularity will continue in the future? Well, I have to say every year I think, okay, Nina, this is the year that the visitors won't come. And so far it hasn't happened except COVID. COVID managed to do that for us, but, but all else, everything else being equal, our attendance has been on a steady upward trajectory. I've been at the Revere House since 86. Um, when I came in the door, I saw that during the bicentennial, the attendance was 234,000. And I thought that was a made up number. I thought, well, they must've just made that number. Couldn't possibly be, couldn't fit that many people through the house. <laughs> and we were sitting at around 190 and then we got to 200 and then we started to break over 200. And then in 2008, we beat that bicentennial number. And we've just been pretty much steadily up every year. And in 2018, we had 323,000 visitors. Wow. which wow. Um, I think is a number we won't see again for a while. But, you know, so the, so the attendance <laughs> is there. We do keep our price modest, but we are a, a num one of a number of attractions along the Freedom Trail. Very few people are just doing the Paul Revere House. So we're alert to that. The, the makeup of the attendance has always been skewed more towards adults. And that surprises people because we get a lot of school kids but we're not heavily children the way some places are. I think places that are more standalone um, vacation, like Colonial Williamsburg or vacation places where you get a lot of families, we get families in the summer, but our attendance is mostly adults um, and it's not, 
it's it's adults across the spectrum. You know, twenty somethings on a date. Amazing, a date at wow. the home of your house. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, people people coming in senior citizen groups, people coming as uh, extended families. So it's it's an an adult audience primarily, except those intense uh, school program visits that we do, which we do a lot of. And the complexion of the attendance has changed as well. Um, when I first started the Revere House, most of the people who were not Caucasian were foreign visitors. Now that is changing. And I think it's changing because we're a middle class attraction. And as different groups become part of the middle class, I think that they come to the Revere House. Um, we're not trying to tell stories that don't fit our site, um, but we are trying to tell an expansive story that looks at residents of the property both before and after Revere, and that gets us to a story that's a little more uh, diverse. But I, I think I think historic sites have to function in their lane. You have to take the stories that make sense for your site and then help people find other sites that might take the story even a step further. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, Nina, this may be a little bit premature, but is there anything that's being planned for the upcoming 250th anniversary pertaining to Revere events in particular? Yes, in fact, um, this March, we are going to do a uh, filmed recreation of Revere's Illumination on the first anniversary of the Boston Massacre. Never been tried before. We're gonna do that, so, so stay tuned. We think that's gonna be fun. Um, in addition to that, we are working with a coalition of sites along the Freedom Trail and probably Lexington and Concord to start a preliminary discussion of a curriculum that would be uh, focused on Boston and Massachusetts, but would be applicable for the entire country we think it's important for there to be curriculum out there that's really usable. We're looking at some 3D technology and other things to make that um, interesting and, and, and modern, but also content rich. Um, I think sometimes the delivery mechanism misses the content piece. We wanna make sure that the content is there. Um, we also have some projects on the house. Um, we need to redo some windows. Uh, we're looking at, um, a, a few other things that, that we haven't quite put together yet, but so some are capital projects and some are related to uh, programming that we would do ourselves, but also uh, with other sites along the Freedom Trail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, you, you've alluded to this, uh, how uh, COVID has been disruptive on many fronts. So I wanted to ask, what can people do to get involved, whether as a volunteer or by making a donation or, or joining? What, what can people do to be involved and, and support the work you guys are doing there? Well, I mean, I, I appreciate your asking that because I think, I think all cultural institutions, wherever they sit, um, we are, you know, we made sure that we put ourselves in a financial position that we could weather a storm. This wasn't the storm we anticipated, but um, we will weather it. That said, our reliance on donations and membership, um, both in 2020, we just ended that fiscal year, we're into a new fiscal year, is much higher without earned revenue. So if people wanna check out our website, um, I hope they'll look at some of the materials on our website. Uh, a new feature is Revere House Radio, which I think Robert may have chatted about. Um, we have uh, posted a lot of material in the Revere Express blog. I say, take a look at that. If it touches you, if it resonates, um, click the donation button and, and, and provide a donation. Or if you wanna become a member, we have members all around the country um, and we keep in touch. We have programs that you can be part of. And you know, I think my general message is whether you give to the Revere House or to your local historical society, uh, we're all about supporting history, whether it's next door to you, 
or someplace across the country that, that means something to you, it's really important now for people, I think, to reach out to those cultural institutions and see what they can do. So if not for us, please, for someone who's, or some place that has made a difference in your life. Yeah, I think it's great that you said that. And can I just pester you for one more thing? Can, can you elaborate on the, on the Paul Revere Radio? Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, you know, we were looking at some new things to do. And uh, Robert Schimp, who's our new uh, research director, um, had some radio background. So he approached me and he said, you know, I have this idea for some radio on, on the web. And I thought, I, I loved it because it was retro. Radio is so wonderfully retro. And it just appealed to me. So I, I let him run with it. And if you, uh, last year, April came along. April is our high holy day, practically. And we were in COVID <laughs> lockdown. So Robert ran a series of episodes on the Midnight Bride that were very well received. And we've been adding episodes. Um, and it's really, you know, it's a little nugget of information. And like I said, it's, it is something you can just listen to. We're also going to post transcripts. So if someone um, isn't able to listen to them. They can read the transcripts. Those are going to go up. Um, but I, I really think it's a, it's, it's a little novel. It's, it's a little different and, and it's been, uh, quite well received. And then we also have the Revere Express, which are a new set of blogs that we put up, um, mostly fueled by our energy when we were in the lockdown, but we're going to keep that yeah. going, um, as time goes on. Right. And, and uh, people can, people can, get get on the the station for the radio and and the revere express by just clicking onto the website right you can yes yep okay yep i think it's also on buzzsprout and some other feeds um but if you just go to our website um paulreverehouse.org um you can you can find the radio it's right on the home page and okay. i i you know i i I encourage people to to listen i think it's really it's really fun and hats off to robert that was really his um his idea. I just, um, as a director, I, um, I'm blessed to have um, a senior staff that's really creative and has helped me um, both push me and uh, sometimes I've pushed them. So I think it's, it's, it's a good relationship. A number of us have been together for a long time. Nina, thank you so much for that information. It's really helpful to us, and we'll be more than happy to promote it as we as we have indicated before. So it's been delightful having you today. Thank you so much for taking time to join us. And to our listeners, we've been talking with Nina Zanieri, Executive Director of the Paul Revere Memorial Association. Well, Nina, thank you again for joining us. It's 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 been a great pleasure to have you on the show. I, I think you've been too humble because I've been a big admirer of the work you've done over the years. And I think you've done a fantastic job. And I think you, you have surrounded yourself with a, with a great staff. So hats off to you. And to our listeners, we hope you've enjoyed another in a series of interviews from the Dr. Joseph Warren Historical Society. Please consider subscribing as we'll be continuing these discussions with various authors and experts. My name is Christian Despina. And on behalf of my colleague, Randy Flood, and myself, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. And, and Nina, thank you so much for making the time to speak with us. Thank thanks you. So I, I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks so much. Yep.